we are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Lindsey Patterson, Mike Santagata here. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing, Lindsey? Not too bad. Not too bad. Day two of the offseason. Um, plenty to get to. And we're not going to break down the Bengals and Browns game. Uh, I think that that was a – It honestly, when I was there, I was thinking, you know what? Is the la- Is the extra game really needed in the NFL? Not that one, but some of them. Yeah, it just says, uh, yeah, for that, it was, it was, um, it was productive for the Cincinnati Bengals because, you know, you got some of the rookies out there in the second half, but I'm glad that one's over and we go into the off season. Um, it really is unfortunate that that game didn't matter to get in the playoffs because that would probably be the easiest game to get into the playoffs just with what the Browns are playing. And, you know, it did give the Bengals an opportunity to play a lot of their backups, but at the same time, it was, Anything you want to say about that game? Um, uh, happy that like Jordan Battle got his first career interception and some of the other things, you know, USC Voss catching a couple of touchdowns. There's, we should, you know, these guys, we should be uh, excited for them. Even if the game itself didn't seem to really matter too much. Um, there was still – these are real stats. These are This is a real game. This is not a preseason game, even though I think it feels like preseason week 3.5 when neither team has anything to play for. Uh, still, yeah, these, these reps counted. They did, and now it's over. Uh, kind of going into the offseason, Joe Burrow talked to the media. Um, you know, credit to him because – the last day they were available in the locker room was Monday and he um, agreed to do a press conference. It was the first time the uh, media and reporters and I'm sure fans have heard from him since the injury, the press conference the day after the injury. And um, you know, there were a lot of takeaways for that. I think a lot of people just, they want Joe Burrow updates. And from here in January, all the way to OTAs, people are going to be wanting and, you know, hoping to hear from Joe Burrow, maybe an update, maybe a throwing video. And it really sounds like, um, you know, OTAs is kind of the outlook for Joe Burrow when it comes to throwing again he didn't want to put a timeline on it which is totally fair and um you know I I wouldn't be surprised if if they take it as easy as possible when it comes to this rehab process he obviously has a process that he's going to be following with the trainers um you know with his physician that he obviously had worked with or at least he had a surgery with in in Philadelphia um but I I just think overall um I'm not really super surprised that it's kind of more of an OTA. Let's see what it looks like in OTAs if he's throwing again. Yeah, yeah, just keep. And I also the patient waiting game that uh, nobody wants to do. <laughs> no, no, it's not fun. It's not fun. There's, it's just, um, it's just you know. When is Joe Burrow going to throw? I don't know. And we also have like the instant news cycle. So I feel like every day is, did Joe Burrow throw today? Did Joe Burrow throw today? It's not like waiting for like, oh, I got news. Joe Burrow threw it. So I feel like I'm opening up something like news, news. <laughs> it's been 10 minutes, but got to check again. Yeah, right. But you know what the thing is? We've been able to see Joe. Um, he's been at practices. He's obviously been at every single game. Um, and I think even traveled with the, the team to away game. So that's been really huge, just having Joe Burrow there, I think. Uh, but one thing I did notice is maybe it was just for the press conference purposes. He wasn't wearing a brace at all for the first time um, since the public appearances. Um, his brace was starting to get smaller and smaller. And even seeing him at the game on Sunday, he just had his normal uh, brace on and uh, maybe the little black thing that he's been having to stabilize it. But um, I did notice no brace in that press conference. And then, like I said, maybe it was just more of a, hey, I'm going to go do this real quick. I don't know how long he has to wear a brace a day. Um, but, you know, obviously every day he did say he's starting to feel better and that's absolutely huge. But honestly, I just don't expect any updates for Joe Burrow. And one of the other things, there, there's a couple things I want to pull from his press conference when he was talking to the media, because it's the first time we've heard from him in almost two months. But, um, you know, he had said, kind of what what could change in this offseason, what would be different for him. And I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but one of the biggest things for him is not going so full go as they're getting ready for training camp and kind yeah. of 
relaxing a little bit. And and who knows if that will change or if that will mean anything going into this training camp just because of him having never having a normal training camp in his pro football career. So maybe that will be something for him. And, you know, just taking this camp in as far as feeling better with his throwing hand and and what the outlook will be when it comes to, you know, when he's finished rehabbing. Cause we just, we don't know what that timeline looks like. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I, I think it's a six month recovery process, <laughs> uh, but I don't know. I, I'm very much on just, uh, I'll, I'm going to have to do like, I, I know there's the playoffs now, the Super Bowl and then free agency and then the draft. And then by the time that all ends, we might get a Burrow throws the ball moment. That would be huge. That would be huge. He did uh, right after the press conference, he did post his Instagram photo of the return of the Jedi. He has really good captions on Instagram, but um, he just seems he's ready to go, ready to get back out there. And um, there was another thing that uh, was asked and and not really surprising when it comes to this team, obviously more than likely going to be moving on from Tyler Boyd and free agency. No real surprise there, but T Higgins, I think you and I both have agreed that it feels like a franchise tag on T Higgins. I I feel like I feel very confident that is a franchise tag on T Higgins versus him walking or a multi-year extension um, in the 2024 off season. And Joe Burrow, um, you know, he he voiced his opinion. He sounded very optimistic about it. He even mentioned, you know, there, there were the contract was put in a certain way for some of these players to come back. And I think that's absolutely huge because we don't know a whole lot of the details when it comes to Joe Burrow's extension, Um, just the numbers, what it kind of looks like the cap hits. But uh, I think having those conversations with the front office is absolutely huge for Joe Burrow and how that impacts other star players on this team. They're more than likely going to pay Jamar Chase this off season. They don't have to, but I feel like they're going to get it done this off season. So when he was talking about T Higgins, and I know there's comparison to say, well, he said the same thing about Jesse Bates. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like Joe knows a lot that's happening behind the scenes and probably has had conversations with the front office, probably has had more time to have conversations with the front office this season. And I wouldn't be surprised if he knows, hey, look, the least we're going to do is franchise tag him. Yeah. Uh, I I think what those comments for me, they didn't really do that much because we we both felt like he'd be back uh, mm-hmm. next season on franchise tag. I feel like it's not going to stop the media cycle until the franchise tag happens from where should he sign next? And mm-hmm. I hope, I hope they have odds for where is T Higgins going to play in 2024? I would put plenty of money on Cincinnati uh, 2025. I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. One thing about this comment though, that makes me, well, there's one thing about this that makes me think uh One thing that this comment makes me think about, sorry, I was phrasing that wrong every time, uh, is the idea of a tag and trade. And I feel like that's less likely when Burrow is bringing that he wants and expects him back next season. I think that was not really on the table if you know the Bengals, but it may have, it was definitely more likely than them just letting him walk. And we don't know how the contract talks are going, but it was possible in my mind that it was about as likely as that as as a long-term extension. Now I feel like if I was odd setting, I would still have, you wouldn't win much money betting on a franchise tag and play, but I would kind of move the extension and the tag and trade probably about even, maybe even have extension slightly higher. I just feel like after that, you know, like let's just, tag him and run it back and we'll figure we'll kick this can right down the road yeah because the joe burrow impact as far as his contract really doesn't start to hit him until 25 and 26 um so they still have a lot of flexibility and and good cap health going into this offseason and that's good news for them because there's still a lot of players that they're going to need to either resign or spend in free agency so for me t higgins i just i i feel that way we are going you know it's never going to end if the Bengals do say we're going to franchise tag him when it comes to those conversations, will T Higgins show up to camp? Will T Higgins play on this? And, and if you look at T Higgins rookie deal, this is a lot of money on a franchise tag. It's about $22 million for one year. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's just. Although that's about the same amount of money. Isn't that the same amount of money that Jamar Chase is going to make on the fifth year option? True. True, true, true. <laughs> yes, 
these receivers are going to make a lot of money for the Cincinnati Bengals in 2024. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I'm just, I'm not really surprised about it. Well, there could be a lot of conversations of people saying, you know, what happens in 2025? Look, I just watched my quarterback go down in November when they were really starting to get it going. I do not think that far in advance what's happened in 2025. I'm focusing on 2024, this offseason, free agency, the NFL draft, what Joe Burrow's rehab looks like. Do they sign Jamar Chase? What do does next season look like? I could care less at 2025 right now. I, I really just, I'm not thinking that way. And guess what? We don't have to. Uh, the front office has to decide what their financial outlook is going to be after yeah. that. So yeah. I'm just, I'm, I, I just, I, I don't know. It was good hearing from Joe Burrow. And, you know, he, he did bring up another point, you know, outside of the T Higgins uh, comments, he, he, he had said something and I was like, yeah, he's 100% right. He got injured when this team normally ramps it up in the season, when they really get it going. You know, coming out of that bye week, a lot of people said, is it going to be like last year when they went on a streak? This team can really play in December and January, and they start to get it going. They just have those slow starts, and obviously he's battled injuries. And I think he's right. Um, I actually put that comment on social media, and the reaction on it was um, a little mixed from other fan bases, but I, I do agree with Joe, um, you know, if he doesn't get injured in that game, that's when that's when this team really starts to shine. And um, yeah, that's all because unfortunately, last time we heard from him, it was all injury talk. He just found out he got the really devastating news about the season ending injury and this doom and gloom. And this one's kind of like, OK, this is what I know, had the surgery. And that's kind of a look back on on what the season really means to me and, and not taking this stuff for granted when I do get to play football. Yeah, uh, definitely true about when it, when he ramps it up. We saw that the past couple of weeks before that game and in that uh Ravens game. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think I'd feel confident saying the Bengals win that game. They were winning when Burrow got hurt, but uh, with how the defense played, that would be a shootout against a very good defense. And sorry, uh, oh, hopefully only for this year, defensive coordinator. Yeah, he'll go higher on commanders. <laughs> He's getting a lot of interviews, it seems. So I think it's definitely possible that they don't win that game, but it would be more competitive. And I do think they win more games down the stretch. We had, it is part of that instant news cycle. Like you have to react so hard to every game. And mm -hmm. so after the third week of Jake Browning, it was like, is Burrow even good? Jake Browning's numbers are pretty comparable. And it's just like, guys, please no, stop this. But that, that ended after, uh, couple of stinkers in a row and then a good one to end it. I think he showed he is a quality backup. And I I mean, I don't think certain things are out of the realm. Like a, like a Ryan Fitzpatrick career isn't out of the realm of possibility. I mean, that's basically how Fitzpatrick got started last time was Palmer went down and he was like, not great, but not terrible. I don't think he was terrible. I could be misremembering 2000 and uh is that that was 2008 yeah it's magic um, yeah it could be missing around 2008 but that, that's what i was thinking of was like he stepped in big quarterback kept being a little bit of a backup guy would get hurt in front of him he started showing got better and better he actually talked about this is off topic a little bit he actually talked about how he got better when he left to other organizations and he got put into some roles and learn different systems. And he was like, oh, that's how you teach systems. It's like, it started all making sense to him. So maybe that happens with Browning. You know, but the Bengals likely keep him next season because mm -hmm. he's got that restrictive free agent exclusive tag that they can give him. And I don't think anybody's going to give the draft capital to match it or whatever needs to happen. So he's probably here again next season. Then the year after, I think he probably gets a, some type of either high-end backup where the starter either gets hurt a lot or they don't trust him or they're going to draft a guy, but they don't want him to start right away. Or he could even be signed as maybe a bridge guy, depending on how this next season goes. Hopefully we don't see him, but you never know. Yeah. I definitely hope we don't see Jake Brown. Well, actually you do hope you see him week 18, the one seeds wrapped up, you're 14 and two. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. I'm totally fine with that. It, it uh, go ahead, you know. But I, I really hope we get Joe Burrow for a full season because, I mean, it. I, I know a lot of people want to put the look. The guy's injury prone, but when he's getting two full seasons in there and they're going to AFC Championship games back to back years, one in a in a difficult AFC. I wouldn't even say it was as difficult this year, but in a very difficult AFC in back to back years is really incredible. So I want Joe Burrow back out there. Um, for Jake Browning, this team is in a really good position. 
uh, with him. I, I know, you know, maybe a couple of weeks ago, people thought, what can you get for him when it comes to draft picks? And I say, no, 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 no. They have to offer him like $900,000 to bring him back next year. And that is easy money for them to go ahead and do. I don't think they're going to give a multi-year contract to Jake Browning. And that would be silly for him to do that because he could make a lot more money the following season. Um, if he just signs the, what the Bengals have to offer to match that because he's restricted. Um, so they're in a really good position to have Jake Browning come back as the backup quarterback. And I think a lot of teams, it's kind of wild because the Bengals are really criticized going into this year of they didn't uh, value the backup quarterback position. And then he ends up playing better than a lot of the other backups when he needed to perform. And I think he surprised a lot of people, even Brian Callahan and Zach Taylor, but that's a lot of credit to the coaching staff, including guys like Dan Pitcher. So Outside of Jake Browning, there are other players I want to get to. Plenty of Joe Burrow, T. Higgins future, this offseason and updates when it comes to the Cincinnati Bengals when they get back to OTAs. But there are other players that we can kind of look back on. And I think a lot of people are playing the comparison game on what their future holds to starters for the Cincinnati Bengals next on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati, and the topic of conversation, I will say this, and I've said it a few times on the show, a player getting his first full season, I know it might be year two in the NFL, but getting his first full season in the NFL, being called a bust, he should no longer be a safety, draft another safety, get him out of there. It's absolutely crazy to me how some fans are feeling about Dax Hill. Can you want more out of that? 100%. Was he Jesse Bates automatically when he was out there? No, he wasn't. It's a learning curve still. But Dax Hill, can you can you just give some of your thoughts on his first full season as a starter? I sure can because I have rewatched. I'm writing a Dax Hill article, and I don't know if it'll be out by the time you're listening to this. I'm leaning that it might not because I'm taking my time with this. Um, not like there's anything I need to be in a hurry for, <laughs> you know. Say it, but um, I've rewatched every single game up until. Uh, I'm at the Jaguars game. So I feel like that really, the, the one big thing that put into perspective was like, yeah, I know Dax Hill kind of, kind of ended on a low note, especially even week 18 there didn't have a good game, but we're forgetting. I, I feel like early season Dax Hill. Yes. There were a couple of rookie things in there, but he was pretty good. He had picks. He had two picks in the first four games. He broke up passes. He was he was showing some range, the athleticism, everything you're asking for. Another thing is that through those first 12 weeks or whatever I've watched, uh, I would also say he's actually pretty good at man-to-man coverage on the tight end. I don't know if we're just forgetting some things, but when you focus in on like just him and when that matchup happens, it's it's good. Like I, I was, I was a little bit surprised and maybe I'm going to lose that opinion a tiny bit over the last couple of weeks. Um, but I think having that refresher of like how he did against Dalton Kincaid when he was matched up, how he did against Isaiah likely in the matchup, how he did, even he has some plays against Mark Andrews in their matchup that made me go like, Oh yeah, like <laughs> it makes sense why they want him to be the tight end stopper. Like he's actually pretty good at this job. Um, and then the, where that made them, where that really showed up was, Pat Fryermuth, his big game, the one I just watched, uh, but his big game in the first matchup, none, one catch against Dax Hill and man coverage. The rest of it was all beating some zone stuff. There was one play. I think Dax probably was the guy that was supposed to cover him, but it was a zone match coverage type of thing. It wasn't like man-to-man, that's our tight end stopper against him. It was like a, a busted coverage situation instead, and we can talk a little bit more about that too. But I think there is some like learning he needs to do, and hopefully I'm not – misremembering the last couple of weeks too much because I know more about the first 12 weeks now that I've rewatched all of that this past weekend and up through Tuesday. Uh, I I think, I think he's, I know the PFF grade's not great. I think that's heavily influenced by safeties aren't involved in a lot of plays, first of all. So when you get a minus one as a safety, it's much worse than getting a minus one as like an offensive lineman or a linebacker or defensive line. Like that minus one is like, Ooh, that's why Jesse Bates always had weird grades. It would be like, okay, the ball's in the air and he got dunked on. That's minus one from PFF. And he doesn't really get a lot of opportunities to make up for that because they don't throw at safeties that often. So you have to make the play when the ball's in the air. 
I think he's fine. I think I think I would go as far to say as next year. I would probably expect more consistency, a little less rawness, a little, a little smoother, you know, like not rough around the edges like that. And I would expect him to be solid, maybe even pretty good. Like I don't think I would go into next year. And some of this is probably the expectations that we put on this, but I don't think I would go into next year thinking like, oh, this guy's going to be an all pro, a pro bowl. He's going to replace Bates. I would go in there thinking like, okay, he was up and down. Overall, I might go fine. There was stuff he did well, stuff he did not do well. And some of it makes sense. Some of it is real areas of concern. But when you watch him overall, I think I I personally, I would not bring in a guy that I think is going to start over him. I don't think I would try to draft a replacement for him and try to move him to nickel. He has way more flashes at safety than he does at nickel. I think the nickel thing is just draft takes that have kept going where when he's played there at the NFL level, he hasn't shown much. It's don't know what, don't know why he matches up better with tight ends. He matches up better trying to play. He's actually okay at post safety, like the single high deep safety. I think he does some pretty good stuff there. It's actually the half stuff, which is usually the easier thing, but it kind of makes sense because I don't think he ever did that at Michigan where he's struggling and quarters a little bit that's been up and down, but yeah, I, it's a long way to say, I think Dax Hill next year should be solid to pretty good. I don't think I'm running out to replace him. I think that'd be a waste of the draft capital you spent and it's wasting a cheap contract because I've seen people talk about like, I'll just go and sign Antoine Winfield. Antoine Winfield's getting tagged. First of all, that's basically the T Higgins thing, but Tampa, uh, but yeah, he's getting tagged. And second, you're going to go drop, probably close to what Bates would have made if not what he makes to go bring in another safety when I don't think Dax Hill was so bad. I kind of want to go through the position groups and I don't know. I wonder if, Oh, oh, I bet both of us, but like kind of just like um, in my mind of just where I stand right now of like, do you need a starter need depth could use an upgrade or I wouldn't really touch that. And for safety, I, I don't know if it's a hot take. I wouldn't really touch it. I'm just letting those two roll. I agree with you. And there's more I want to say about the safety position. And I think you bring up a good point. And that's something that, you know, there's no playoffs for the Cincinnati Bengals. So we can kind of dive into when it comes to, do they need another position, uh, need another player here? What does that look like? What does the future look like in 2024? We will get to that and probably a little more on Thursday and in the following week uh, with a little preview of the playoffs. So plenty of time this off season to get to that. But I think that brings up a really good point, a thing to dive into when it comes to some of these players, but let's stick with the safety position right now. We'll stay with the side of the ball that I want to hit on offense and we'll kind of wrap up this episode before we get into Thursdays. But you, you bring up really good points about Dax Hill and you're going to have a great piece. It's not complete yet. You're taking your time, right? Yep. It's, taking your time yeah. and it's going to be available. And I think Bengals fans should read it. If you feel a certain way about Dax Hill, look, I'm not here to tell you you're supposed to believe that this guy is going to be an all pro in 2024. You know, who knows what the future holds, but just stay calm, have patience. Um, You know, just like we've said before, when it comes to guys like, and I know it's a little bit different because Miles Murphy plays a different position and he's a rookie this year. And this is really Dax Hill's first real year as a starter, Um, but have patience with these guys. Um, they're still, you know, going out there learning this in in the first year and and kind of catching up with that. It is very different from being on the sidelines for Dax Hill to being out there in a starter role. Yes, you had guys like Jesse Bates and Von Bell, and they were huge leaders and veterans to have in your locker room, but it's different when you're the starter. And Mike's going to have a really good piece on that, but I want to stay with safety because it was really encouraging. I think if we were to go back on the draft when the Bengals in the third round picked um, Jordan Battle, we thought, I don't know how you thought about it. I thought, okay. I was a little surprised, not because yeah, I didn't. My, my reaction was, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, well, you know, Lou, I trust Lou uh, when it comes to these secondary players. And Jordan Battle, you know, took advantage of opportunities. I'm sure there's some things that he can still, you know, learn in this offseason and going into 2024. But overall, was a really high, high graded rookie over on uh, PFF, too. Yeah, they loved him. Uh, and I think he was good. I think he was a good starting safety and that's hard to do. Uh, but yeah, he, he excelled at pretty much everything they asked of him. I think that his, his tackling was like a revelation because 
Nick Scott was not tackling very well. And Dax Hill has his ups and downs, taking the ang- proper angles and tackling. And then Jordan Battle gets in there, and he's making the tackle almost every time. There was It was through like the first four starts. I think he didn't miss a tackle. I think he did miss a couple after that, but that's just how it goes. It was cool. It, it, I really liked how Jordan Battle played his rookie season. And, yeah, I, I just – those two guys, I feel like that's your two starting safeties for next year. I, I 95% confident that that's what they would roll with week one. Maybe and a little bit under that. I don't know. I think you bring up a good point. It's cheap. They're on, on these rookie deals. Yeah. That would be absolutely huge when it comes to the safety position. Everybody knows about what happened with Jesse Bates. They franchise tagged him, franchise tagged him. Then he left and got a really good contract and good for Jesse Bates. And, having and a he played role. really well in Atlanta. Really well, and I'm happy for him. That is amazing. Rooted. I love Jesse Bates when he was here. Um, he he created so many huge opportunities in January. Um, I mean, there's so many things we could point out, but I'm not going to go back down memory lane because we've talked about it plenty of times. But you're saying right now, and again, we will go through different position groups this offseason. Safety position is one you wouldn't touch. The only thing I could see touching is letting Nick Scott go and bringing in a different third safety. Mm-hmm. I actually whatever. I've been soft with Nick Scott. <laughs> you know, I feel like I, he, I've been warmer on him than a lot of people. I don't think it's terrible to have him as your third safety. Like, I don't think that's crazy different from when they had Ricardo Allen as the third safety, but I understand that people were kind of burned by it and he gave up his fair share of explosive plays. So it is what it is. If you move on, I just, I don't, he's an okay. He, he's a solid blitzer and he does some stuff. He has starting experience. He has playoff experience. Some of that's like, He's cheap too on his current deal. So that's why I'm, I'm fine with it. But I also feel like if somebody out there shows up and is possible to be your third safety, sure, like that, that's fine. But I don't think I would try to touch the starting group. And I'm sure people are screaming right now uh, that that third safety is actually Tyson Anderson. And my response to that is once I see it in a regular season game, I will be with you. But preseason, I, I don't fall for the preseason superheroes, which was bad that I didn't fall for Tanner Hudson. <laughs> and he's coming off an injury, and that's just yeah, going to that be too. that's going to be really tough. Um, and you know him and and even DJ Ivy, obviously cornerback, but safety or a special teams position player, uh, his rookie year, and that those were both unfortunate injuries for them uh kind of going forward we don't have a whole lot of time in this podcast so i'm going to stick with the defensive side of the ball sorry producer spencer i will get to the offense on thursday but uh, another position group because there's plenty to talk about on the defensive side of the ball it was definitely underwhelming this year and um let's just stay with cornerback room because it's more than likely i would say cam taylor Britt. you're gonna have d how do you feel about dj turner starting more again Honestly, similar to how I feel about Dax Hill, I think. So you feel pretty good about it? There were some explosive plays, but I think it's all connected with other positions. Yeah, right? I, I, I feel like people get scapegoated um, for these explosive plays, and lately it was Dax Hill and some DJ Turner. DJ Turner, up and down. Similar to how I feel about Dax Hill, what I talked about mm-hmm. that was like up and down overall, you, you could describe as fine. I don't think he was – really very often a reason for this defense being extremely lackluster. I think he gave up his fair share of plays. He made some plays. Uh, The lack of length and size shows up. You can't improve the length, but you can improve the size. I think if he gets a little bit more stout, he might lose some of that movement ability, which would stink because I think the way he moves on the field is like how you would generate a cornerback in Madden to perfectly be able to move, but it's, can he hold strength? Strength is not just like making tackles and playing run defense, but when you're, when the receivers, these, all, all these guys push off to be able to not budge when a guy puts a hand in it, because he got budged with tank Dell pushed him. And I was like, okay, okay. Put this, let's hit the weight room a little bit. Um, and the length thing was interesting because the comparison in my head to what I kept seeing was the ball just beat his outstretched fingertip, right? Like you could think of the Jordan Addison play and some of these other plays where the ball just got outside of his fingertip. Chidobe Awuzie had that issue in Dallas. And I remember that 
when I watched him when he first signed, I was watching for free agency. I was like, man, he gets beat a lot by perfect throws and the ball just getting outside of his fingertips. DJ, DJ Turner actually has, uh, I think, like by a hair longer arms than Chido Bebuzie. So they both have those short arms. And I think Chido overcame it because he's a little bit more stout. He's over 200 pounds uh, and he's he got better technically and he got better at playing to his leverage and, you know, some of the stuff that's going to take Turner time. But I think if you take the time with Turner, I don't think he showed that you should replace him next season in my mind. I don't think, and another guy that I don't know why everybody wants to put somebody into the slot. Now he's got, he's, he's the right size because he's small but I don't see him as a slot guy because he doesn't have like that Mike Hilton maniac linebacker mentality. Dax Hill has that a little bit more, um, but Turner's worst plays I thought also came from the slot. So it, it didn't look to me like, Oh, you know, like when they put him in the slot, he's clamps and when he's outside, he can't hang with these guys. It's kind of the opposite. Uh, and I thought he hung with guys better outside than he did when he moved to the slot. Maybe I just have that one Zay flowers play stuck in my head, but. I'm still annoyed about that Ravens game and the the pass interference call that was against Casper, the friendly ghost, because there was nothing there when they called that on the road. Do you remember that? The pass interference on DJ Turner when there oh was my god, yes, because I just watched it. Yeah, yeah, in the Ravens game. Yeah. Well, I mean, the game it was. Oh, that's still and, and you know what is when that stuff happens. I know people love PFF. That gets like a negative one on that your PFF grade. Those are people – you should not be able to grade things like that. Sorry. You shouldn't. I you think should. I saw somebody say like when it's an obvious shouldn't have been called, they don't do it. And that was in relation to a Jesse Bates play like three years ago. But I, I don't know. Like I, I don't know the exact grading process or if something like that doesn't go through or whatever. It, it's just weird. I, I don't know. People use, and I think PFF does stuff that is very useful. I think the thing that they do might that might be not as useful as their grading. And people use those grades. people people use those grades as like I always think of it as like your Yu-Gi-Oh score. <laughs> like, ah, my corner has a ninety-three, but the, the wide receiver has a sixty-four. He's done. It's like I don't know. Football is so qualitative and like I would use words to describe things and mm. describe how somebody excels or doesn't or what they struggle with, what they're good with. Cause it's not like anybody goes out there and you know, like, yeah, he's, he's a 64. Like when I, when I watch him, that, that's all I think. I think like, Oh, he's struggling with this. He's good with this. And same with guys that are really good. It's like, you think of Jesse Bates. It's like, he's probably got a PFF grade of like 90 something. You're like, well, mm. when he's doing the stuff he's really good at, he's definitely that good. But there are certain things like, very, you know, put him into the box and run at him, and the nineties no longer there. <laughs> like, yeah. not that it's terrible, but uh, it, you know, I, I don't know. This is a stupid rant, but I just, I don't like the, uh, I, I don't, I don't love the way people use PFF grades and scores. No, they have favorites. I I just take it for what it is. Um, I, I trust there's plenty of people. I mean, even in, in the Bengals world, including yourself, who you can follow them, break down tape, and you'll get more information than your local PFF grade. Um, but that's besides the point. So you're feeling, when it comes to the safety cornerback room, not too bad going into the next year. No, I, I don't think there's a safety in the first round that you would take, even if he fell to you, because I just – very cursory looks at things. I have not looked at any players specifically, but I've looked at like where do guys where do guys rank on like um consensus board right now, trying to get a feel of like who might be there when the Bengals pick. There's a lot of guys because <laughs> they're picking higher than normal. Um, but corner, I think, could happen, and that's the one reason I think where I was like 95% confident those are your safeties to start next year. I think if they love a corner and he falls to them in round one, that is the scenario that pushes maybe Turner back. I don't think they're going to go out and try to sign a big-name corner to a big to a big contract. They just This team has, to me, more real holes than he filled. Like, nose tackle, if Reader leaves, is a huge yeah. one. 
three technique that they haven't bothered to fix since Ogan Joby left. You could talk about right tackle if Jonah leaves. There's no maybe your tight end, you just run it back with the guys you've got. Um, wide receiver, since Boyd is probably leaving, and the ticking clock on T. Higgins if they don't get an extension done. Like they, there's real holes on the team that it feels like bringing in even guys that are make like seven million dollars per year is like kind of a waste of resources to me where i just think like ah, but what if you just got a better nose tackle or you just got a better three technique or like i don't know how you could feel like the Bengals are making the right move to go sign like let's say a safety for six million to replace dax and a corner for six million to go replace uh or compete or whatever with turner and then you have to go get a right tackle right so you can go spend 12 million dollars there or something and now well that's 24 million dollars and what if you just ran it back with the two guys that are on cheap deals and signed t higgins to an extension like <laughs> that goes through my mind of like that might be a better usage of your resources right even if it's not a huge extension, like it like probably will have to be, but I don't know, that, that goes through my brain of like when you're trying to build this team to be the best they can be, not just for next year, but for the next three years, that feels like a way better way to do that than to try to plug gaps with older veterans that what if those guys just step up? Like I could see it. They're both young. They're both premium picks for a reason. And at one point I felt like everybody was super high on those two. And mm -hmm. now everybody wants them replaced. So I don't know, two cents on that. Probably way more than two cents, but. Plenty to get to when it comes to position groups. We'll do a quick one to two minute quick reaction on the season to wrap it up next on it's always game day in Cincinnati. We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. This is a very quick look. We've talked plenty about the Joe Burrow injury, Jake Browning as a starter, the defensive struggles. But when you look back on the 2023 season, how are you feeling about it going into this offseason? Besides all the holes, they still have to get in free agency in the NFL draft. Uh, it was kind of a failure. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think we can be blunt about that. You expect a Super Bowl contention and instead don't make the playoffs. But I think it was an understandable failure. Your quarterback got hurt, mm -hmm. and the quarterback got hurt twice, basically. He wasn't himself in the first four games, so you go one and three, and then he's not there for the last few games. And so, end of the day, when that happens, it kind of makes sense that you didn't have the season you were expecting. I think that would happen for Kansas City, Buffalo, any of these other teams out there they would probably have the same struggles if the quarterback went down. So while it was a failure, it was, you can understand why there are holes to be filled. There are free agents that need decisions made and it'll be an interesting off season to see the probably tagging Higgins, but what do you do outside of that? Do you, you know, like, are you going to try to just run it back with some of these guys, like go offer Jonah Williams a big two year deal and like, we need to get that out of here. Not huge, but you know, like market value two year deal. Maybe that's 14, 15 million a year. And just like, boy, we don't want to go mess with the free agent right tackle market or try to have like force ourselves to draft one. Or do you just let that go and you kind of get a stop gap and you think like, yeah, we might get a right tackle to fall to us. Maybe that Mims guy from Georgia or the Latham guy from Alabama. Uh, I don't know. It'll be, it'll be interesting. I want them to re-sign reader. But yeah. we'll see. Oh, man, that'd be great, right? Like, when you're ah, young. One, ah, come on. He's earned something here. Two year deal. <laughs> I just three I, years I, with an out after two years in case he looks old. <laughs> they will definitely have an out on year three. Um, but um, but yeah, no, I wouldn't be surprised. DJ Reader and T. Higgins, those are the two that I feel like will come back for me personally. I think you bring up a good point. No surprise when you think of teams like Buffalo, Kansas City, the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, when your starting franchise quarterback goes down, it changes your offense. I think there are ways to look at this as a glass half full going into next year because look, we've been bummed for two months when Joe went down, and that was a lot of um, not fun football at first. And then obviously Jake went on his run, but I think you can look at it as maybe there will be some changes with how they change the offense a little bit. 
um, look, it's it's difficult when Joe's out there. And that just is credit to Joe Burrow being the talented franchise quarterback that he is. But maybe there's some different things that they'll be able to do going into next year. When it comes to running the ball, Joe Burrow mentioned it in his press conference. They need to get more explosive at running the ball. I think that's huge for him to say. That is extremely important when you think about the running back room. We'll get to the position group, the outlook of what that looks like on plenty of podcasts this offseason. But I think you can look at that. And Joe's voice to the front office is extremely important. And I think he's probably, again, had time to talk to them about, hey, this is how I feel about this. And they listen. Um, you know, it, it's it's going to go fast. I know a lot of how a lot of Bengals fans feel. It's not going to be until August or September until they really take the field again. But you get you get playoffs over with. The Super Bowl will be here. Free agency is going to be here in no time. Franchise tag deadline will be here. And then the NFL draft and then OTAs are right around the corner. So it will go fast and we'll obviously be counting down to, to training camp. Um, it's just unfortunate because I've said it before. You looked at the playoff picture in the AFC side and it just feels so open still. I know that the Ravens are really dominant on both sides of the ball. I don't think people are talking enough about their defense, but the Cincinnati Bengals had an opportunity this year. And that's what the stinger is. Um, when I look at the playoff picture, especially in a down year, I would say down year for Kansas City. Watch them go off in the playoffs somehow. Um, but I just, yeah, I, I'd say I'm bummed. I'm still bummed about it, but I, I look forward to the offseason. I, I think they're in a different kind of um, transition phase. I, I've said it before. I feel like it's a very, very soft rebuild. Um, nothing too crazy. You still have your opportunity. The window is Joe Burrow's whole career. As long as he's healthy out there, I believe in this team on both sides of the ball. It'll be interesting to see if any of the assistant coaches, uh, Brian Callahan has a request of an interview for the Panthers. Dan Pitcher is definitely a popular guy when it comes to maybe some OC interviews. Will that happen for a lot of teams? Hopefully he stays in Cincinnati. He's been a huge part of Jake Browning and his growth this season. So, um, you know, it's still be, it's still be used to, huge to get those guys back. Um, I'm still a huge fan of the offensive coordinator and obviously Lou and Arumo coming back and the defense just has to play better, uh, but plenty of position groups value off season predictions uh, to come as we get into January. Maybe we'll do a little playoff prediction on our Thursday show. What we think is going to happen. Oh, yeah. Wild card weekend um, should be fun. I, I mean, I always look forward to the playoffs and uh, we'll see what happens the first weekend and, and hopefully it, it's good football. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned before, you have a great Dax Hill piece coming out soon over on all Bengals. Really great breakdowns over on your Twitter account. People need to follow Bengals underscore Sands. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson. Thank you guys, as always, all season long, all off season during the draft free agency for listening to it's always game day in Cincinnati. We'll be back later this week.